What is nemez? The answer is simple. It's a textile made from wool. Then what is felt? The same thing, a textile made from wool. In the Hungarian language, there are two words for this material. Nemez refers to handmade, hand-formed objects, and felt refers to the manufactured, standardized wool textile. The Hungarian word nemez connotes the exalted status of this material, a gift from God. Carded wool can be formed and molded using only warm water and our bare hands. It doesn't require any additives or adhesives. Nemez is fundamentally nothing more than tangled, compacted animal fur. Many types of animal fur can be used to create felt, but wool has the best combination of properties. Sheep's wool is oily, wavy, and has a natural curl, which makes it different from the fur of other animals. Fine wool is the best for creating felt. Different types of sheep's wool have different properties and can be utilized with differing degrees of success. The caliber of wool varies with respect to the sheep's type, gender, age, ancestry, and a given animal's specific metabolism. Felt is one of humankind's oldest forms of textile. Although there aren't many clues to its earliest origins, one of the oldest stories describes its miraculous discovery on Noah's Ark. The animals in the Ark traveled in close quarters for many weeks and continuously shed their fur in the warmth of their confinement. They stood and walked and slept on their fur until a wondrously thick, warm, multicolored felt blanket was created under their feet on the floor of the Ark. On the acreage of the Hortobadge Collective, the sheep known as Rotska are sheared in spring during warm, dry spells. These days, the work is partially completed by machine, but a generation ago, it was still done entirely by hand. In those days, the most experienced shepherds could shear between 50 and 60 sheep a day. The shearing is done with the sheep in a sitting position, starting with the belly and the inside of the legs, progressing upwards from the ankles and over the spine. Our Italian friends Seppi and Maria Vittoria Enzio raise Sambucana sheep, a type which is slowly dying out. They keep a flock of about 10 animals, which they shear once or twice a year, depending on the length of wool strands desired. Although many people feel that shearing twice a year yields better quality wool, Maria Vittoria prefers to shear the flock once a year for the longer stranded wool, because it provides superior material for making nemes and weaving. About one and a half kilograms of wool can be sheared from a mature sheep, which should be clean for best results. Wool is washed to remove foreign matter, grease, and the animal's smell. The wool fat, called lanolin, is important to the wool's flexibility and resiliency and shouldn't be washed out completely. Excessive pressure should be avoided during washing because the wool can begin to interlace and shrink and form felt, which will make further handling difficult. Before we can make anything out of the tangled wool, it must first be loosened and carded. Hand carding is done with two identical steel-toothed boards fixed to handles. Gyula Miholko is perhaps the last person in Hungary who uses a traditional but very unusual method of preparing wool for his felt hats. The lamb's wool is loosened with a special device called a fokpona, a cable stretched taut which, when struck, vibrates and loosens the wool into fine layers. In the wool processing workshop of Marton Benze, custom-built machines comb and card the wool into fleece and bands.
Most plants contain some kind of coloring agent and can be used for dyeing wool. We can use bark, flowers, leaves, or fruit to prepare a dye bath. Once we've soaked, boiled, and strained the organic material, we can cook the wool in the dye for 60 to 90 minutes to obtain the desired shade. In Gigi Mosca's dyeing works, between 1 and 3,000 kilograms of wool are dyed every day in about 70 different colors. Dyeing experiments are carried out in a laboratory to ensure that the desired color is obtained. Gigi has a special machine designed to dye fleece. The other machines are cabinet-like in construction, and the wool is submerged in skeins, dyed at 90 degrees Celsius, and then centrifuged and dried. For hand dyeing, we can use synthetic coloring agents like aniline, as well as organic dyes. The wool should be cooked for an hour to reach the desired color and fixed with vinegar and salt. One of the oldest uses of felt is in the fabrication of rugs. I'm going to make a rug using patterns cut out of sheets of partially finished felt sheets. The half-finished material is called pre-felt, which has begun to cling together, but can still be applied and worked into another felt surface. The pattern goes onto the table, or rather onto a flexible surface laid on the table. It could be canvas, a reed mat, or bubble pack. I have to think in reverse for this. The design elements of the rug, which will be on top, have to be placed on the bottom using this method. After the pattern is laid, I start to build up the layers of the rug itself. I'm using wool carded into fleece for the rug because I can build it up in large sections. The consecutive layers of wool are laid with their strands running perpendicular to each other. In this way, we can achieve the most balanced distribution of material and the rug will shrink in perfect proportion from all sides when we start to knead it. 
reinforce the edge with a little extra wool because otherwise the ends of the strands will be too thin. I'm using six layers for this rug and I'm expecting it to shrink by about 40%. Felt prepared using this technique can shrink anywhere from 20 to 300% depending on the thickness and quality of the wool. I cover the layers of wool with a smooth mesh and sprinkle it with warm soapy water. After I have compacted the layers, I work on the edges of the rug. In general, several people are needed to knead a rug to the desired consistency, depending of course on its size. To begin the process, we are going to roll the rug on a plastic pipe. We roll the rug up from each of its four sides and knead it for about 30 minutes. The felt always shrinks from the direction that it has been rolled up. While we knead it, we constantly move over the entire surface of the roll to prevent it from shrinking irregularly. We squeeze the cooled water out of the roll and each time we re-roll it, we sprinkle it again with hot water. Then we cover it quickly so that the water doesn't cool. After two or three rounds of rolling, we see how well the pattern has worked into the surface and make minor corrections with wet, soapy hands. We can also compact the wool by walking on it. If the felt and the pattern have stabilized, we can leave the pipe behind and roll up the wool in a plastic sheet. After this, the final phase is to roll up the felt rug itself and secure it with canvas or plastic sheeting for the last round of kneading. The finished rug is rinsed with clean water, drained and dry flat into its final form. I use very fine, high-quality merino wool, mostly in band form, to make scarves, and I decorate it with different kinds of textiles in different combinations. Loosely woven silk is good for incorporating into handmade felt, as are cotton and wool-based materials. I make a single thin, broken layer of carded wool, and then stretch the silk over it. The starting dimensions of the scarf should be twice the projected size of the finished product, a 3 meter scarf will shrink and compact to about 1.5 meters. Mm -hmm. 
After wetting the scarf, I massage it through the mesh, very carefully at first, then applying more and more pressure until the fibers of the wool weave through the silk. Then I can roll it up into a tube and knead carefully. I use progressively more and more hot water and begin to knead it with more force. If I use too much force in the beginning, the wool will bond to itself and not work through the surface of the silk. Sometimes I slap it against the table to compact the wool strands. Obviously, we cannot make something like felt with just the silk. It's a layer of wool which shrinks and pulls it together, creating a striking elephant skin texture. I design the bag to its final specifications on paper, then I enlarge this form proportionately and cut the pattern for the bag out of styrofoam sheet. The bag is built up out of five layers of wool and should begin at 140% of its final size. When I'm making a hollow form like this, I usually apply two layers at a time. I apply the first two layers onto the form so that about two centimeters of wool hangs over the sides. Then I sprinkle the layers with water, press it down and turn the form over and turn the excess wool inwards. Only one of the two layers actually hangs over the side of the form, so that the thickness of the bag will be the same at the seams as it is elsewhere, not twice as thick. If I've got four layers on the bag, I turn the bag over onto its front and reinforce the area under the pocket. Then I put the packet pattern onto the inside and apply two layers which hang two or three centimeters over the side. This is where the packet attaches to the bag. I make the upper edge of the packet without cutting, forming it with my hands. I lay the third and fourth layers onto the bag and the packet, then apply the last color transition layer. I ornament the bag with silk squares which are attached with an outline of colored wool to help them stick. I rub and massage the bag until the wool has bound together and the pattern has set on the surface. Then the kneading begins. After one or two rollings, I can take the form out if the felt is strong enough. From this point on, I will work the walls of the bag from sides because the unfinished felt can easily stick to itself if it hasn't compacted enough. I always cut the felt before it's been kneaded into its final state so that I can put the finishing touches on the edge. I knead them with soapy hands and continue to apply hot water until the wool has been strengthened. After rinsing and draining the bag, I stuff it and leave it with its top closed to dry.
The average woman's head circumference is 56 or 57 centimeters. Controlling the final dimensions of a head requires special attention because even a one centimeter difference can be significant. In this case, I apply five layers of wool and begin with a form at 140% of the final size. After the first four layers have been laid, I create the ornamentation for the hat, in this case a long felt noodle and a rose. I leave the last three or four centimeters of the ends row almost dry so that I can attach them later to the surface of the hat. I reinforce this with a little extra wool. I apply synthetic organza to the last layer and then a very thin layer of wool on the top of that to help the organza adhere to the surface since it's relatively stiff, coarse material. I massage the surfaces of the head until the felt has been worked together and strengthened. During the first few rounds of kneading, the pattern of the head remains inside to keep the sides from sticking to each other. When the material is strong enough, the form can be removed. While I'm rubbing the head, I make sure that I move continuously over the entire surface to massage out the seams where the two sides of the head meet. The finished shape must be consistent and uniform in three dimensions. I constantly refer to hat maker's form to check the circumference and shape of the hat as it progresses, in this case a 56 cm form. After washing, the hat is drained and left to dry on the form. I often find inspiration for my head sculptures in nature. Because of this head's large dimensions, I'm going to make it a little thicker than usual. For the first two layers, I'm using merino wool mixed with camel hair. For the edges, I'm going to create another shape, which will be formed by folding. I'm going to build in a pair of fins to the inside of the hat as well. These are prepared separately. I leave three or four centimeters of raw wool at the base of the fins so that I can apply them to the main form. I only work on the upper part of the fins, leaving the lower part for later when I apply them to the main form. When the upper part of the fin is finished, I open it at the bottom edge and then attach it to the main form. Now I'm applying the fifth layer of wool, which will carry the ornamentation and which will be worked together with the lower half of the fins as I apply them to the surface of the hat. I use silk and curly, anchored strands of wool 
and silver and gold ribbons as decoration elements. I apply the ribbons with a thin layer of wool. I massage and rub the head to work in all of its ornamentation and knead it in a roll like the other objects. I cut small holes between the rows of ribbons. These can only be cut when the felt is relatively stable but still has not solidified completely. The edge of incisions will be rubbed to soften them and close the surface. I rub the hose with soapy hands and sprinkle the head with hot water and knead it in a roll. The finishing touches are added on a head form and the completed sculpture is left to dry. Sometimes I create stylized animal figures. After laying the first two layers to the lizard's body, I apply the wool that will become the crest and toes. When the fourth layer is finished, I press and compact the form and then make the triangular crests. I use scissors to create the toes and wrap the edges in wool. The lizard's tail is fabricated separately. I use fleece for the inside and wind it with colored band wool, which is then wound with wool yarn. The tail is kneaded and affixed to the end of the tail stump to be completed with the rest of the body. The partially completed fin is affixed to the top of the body. The crest is first attached from within. I decorated the center of the creature's back with beads strung onto a wool band. I entwined silk strands into the spaces between the beads and massaged the bands into its back through the mesh. Working from the base of the crest to the body of the lizard, I apply the final color transition, then turn it over and fold back the edges and lay the final colors. After this, I roll the lizard once or twice in canvas and pull out the internal form by cutting open the creature's mouth. I rework all the details like the toes and the crest one at a time from the outside, supporting the inside with a wooden spoon so that the internal surfaces don't stick together. I continue to work the wool until the fat compacts and strengthens into its final state. After washing the lizard, I stuff it and leave it to dry. Over the course of the last 30 years, felting has won renewed recognition and more and more followers. Felting is generally relegated to the realm of traditional crafts, but modern felt artisans are finding new roads and new avenues of self-expression, and there are some who have chosen felt making as their personal medium in the world of modern visual and applied arts. It is not enough to simply preserve and nurture traditional crafts. If we want them to survive with integrity, we need to reassess and redevelop them to fulfill the expectations of the applied arts in our own age.